Douglas Murray, you are back on the bookstore shelves with your brand new book, The War on the West. It's out today and already, based on pre-orders alone, you are number one on Amazon. That's fiction, non-fiction, that's absolutely everything. Um, we talk a lot about war at the moment, Ukraine, Russia, but this war on the West has got nothing to do with those, has it? No, it's got nothing to do with, with what's going on, the terrible events in Eastern Europe. Uh, I, I describe something which is a much longer conflict. It's a generational conflict, I claim, uh, which is a war on every single one of the underpinnings of what we in countries like Britain enjoy. Uh, I show in the book that there has grown in the last half century and then suddenly sped up in the last few years this unbelievable conflict that has been waged against every single one of the foundations of our society. So that today, the only group that it is permissible to say racist things about in society are white people, are the majority populations of countries like Britain, countries like America. Everything in our history has been torn down, has been deracinated, has been, has been taken away from us. All of our holy places, all of our great heroes have been one by one removed from us, have been assaulted and removed. Uh, so that even somebody like our greatest Britain, Winston Churchill now, is talked of for his guilt, not for his heroism. The, the same remorseless, racist, colonialist, slavery-based argument has been used against everybody from the British past and the Western yeah. past. The same thing has happened to everything in our religious culture, even our secular culture, our culture of rationalism of enlightenment, of reason, all of these things too are said to be the products merely of dead white males. And then finally, it even goes through everything in our culture so that our art galleries and other public art institutions, our libraries, even theatres, decide that their principal job is not to entertain or educate, but to decolonize. This is a movement against everything in our past, and everything in our present. It is an attempt to completely rewrite us as a country. And I've seen it growing in recent years. And I thought it's time not just to call it out and to identify it, but to push back against it. Well, you've done that with your previous hit books, The Madness of Crowds and The Strange Death of Europe, both massive bestsellers as well, as we know this one will continue to be. Um, but everything you've just said, I absolutely recognise. I think everyone viewing and, and listening right now will recognise. But the thing that perplexes lots of us, and I know you've looked into in the book, is, is where it's coming from. Who is doing this mm. and why are mm. they doing this? Yes. Uh, the first thing is, it comes principally, it has to be said, from America. Uh, it is an American movement from about the 60s, 70s onwards that decided to look at everything in American history through these lights, to say that slavery wasn't just a part of the story of America, but was the story of America. To say that, um, that, that, that racism wasn't just a part of American history, as regrettably, sadly, appallingly, it's been a part of every country's history. But it wasn't enough to say that it was a part of American history. They decided to say it was the entirety of American history, so that even today, even today, Americans are alleged to live in a white supremacist, uh, institutionally racist society. And this flooded through, this set of terrible, reductive, simplistic, and very, very antagonistic ideas flooded through the rest of the English-speaking West in particular. You don't see it as much in France and other countries on the continent, but you do see it very clearly in Britain, in Canada, in Australia, and New Zealand. These are countries that have all been encouraged to believe this. Now, here's the thing. It's spilt out from academia, as almost all bad ideas do. But it, it, it long ago went past academia. I give examples in the book of, think of that, book from 20, 20 years ago, a very popular book of Michael Moore's, Stupid White Men. Mm. You know, you would never, ever expect there to be allowed a book called Stupid Black Men, nor would you want to publish or read such a thing. But it became permissible to talk about white people alone in this very, very racist light. And then in recent years, that sped up. And I'll tell you why I think it happened. I think among other things it happened because firstly, there are people in Britain as well who actually believe this about our society. Yeah. They actually believe that we live in the most oppressive 
patriarchal, cis heteronormative, and crucially racist society. This is the very imagined. bizarre They've thing, never... isn't it? Because it seems to be supposedly mm. the most educated, the most liberal, the most uh, you know globally thinking. The sort of people who say they're a global citizen, not uh, not a, a Britain, mm. who, who seem to think this. And I do wonder: Have they never been abroad? Have they never? Have they never exactly. read any books? Have they have never seen any TV, read any articles about the rest of the world? It, it's very, very obvious to me that that this. And you you touch on this in the book at great length. You know, is that the, the, it's very interesting that the countries that people most want to flee to from other parts of the world mm. are the countries that apparently are so despicable and awful and terrible with the worst history. That's a bit strange, That's right. isn't it? That's right. Uh, I mean, we know that we can't be what these new critics claim we are, because if we were, the world wouldn't want to be coming to us. It's, it's important that we do talk about the things that went wrong in the past. That's how we well, learn. And we talk about slavery. There is nobody walking around in America, Britain, Canada, Australia, was saying, yep, yeah, slavery, absolutely not a problem. Glad we did it. Absolutely. Of course not. It was an yeah. appalling abomination. But again, accepting that it was a bad thing, but that we were not the first empire to do it. <laughs> we were yes. probably the last empire to do it. It's still we were, going on in large we, parts of the, country, of, of the world right now. And we were the country that helped to end it. But this is never mentioned yes. as part of this attack on That's the West. Right. There seems to be a presumption, Julia, uh, on the part of the activists who are anti-Western, that, that they seem to be at the very kindest observation about a century out of date, at the very <laughs> kindest estimation. Uh, I went through all the school curricula in the UK and the US. Slavery is one of the fundamental things that children are taught in education, in history, in all of our schools. Um, colonialism is taught in all of our schools. These are not hidden histories. It's not the case that the National Trust and Kew Garden and the Tate Gallery and all of our, our institutions have to decolonize our country because we're so ignorant and we've all been taught that the colonies were just great. It's not the case at all, at all. Uh, so the best thing you can say is that these people are wildly out of date. But here's the other thing. As you say, Julia, the remarkable thing about Britain, for instance, was not that we had slavery, as every, every society in history had had up until that date. The remarkable thing about Britain is not just that we ended it for ourselves, but spent blood and treasure that meant for the 19th century, our ships patrolled the high seas, mm -hmm to make sure that it was made illegal for other countries as well. And what's interesting, of course, is this idea that everything that's come out of the West is is somehow bad, not just yes. slavery. We uniquely invented slavery, again, completely factually wrong, as you say, but also you know, the Industrial Revolution, scientific, medical breakthroughs that have been huge. You know, look at yeah. what we've just been dealing with with COVID. Which were the countries that came up with those vaccines? Oh, well, it was right. the West, interestingly. But this, yes. this need, this urge to, to only see the bad instead of the good, the bad, the ugly, and seeing you know everything in the round. And yet they don't make the same ju same judgments of other countries, other regimes, and other parts of the world. Why not? No, they d they don't at all. In fact, quite the opposite. They seem to believe that every other country has people born into a sort of Edenic innocence. We are all born into guilt, but uh, everyone else is born into Edenic innocence. And it's simply not the case. One of my contentions in the book is one of the reasons why this war has been pushed on us is because hostile actors, including the Chinese Communist Party, have relished in recent years and reveled in this Western self-flagellation. And indeed, they encourage it. Because whilst we are talking about what we did two centuries ago, the Chinese Communist Party has, of course, a system of concentration camps going on in Xinjiang province as we speak. Uh, just recently, one of the organs of the Chinese Communist Party put out a, a, a um, a, a meme, a cartoon on, on, on Twitter claiming that America is a country of racism and George Floyd and, and family separations at the border. You know, you could ask the Uyghurs, uh, the Uyghur Muslims, whether the Chinese Communist Party really cares about family separation or racism or anything like it. But these countries find it enormously convenient that Britain and America at this point in our history would decide that we, we of all countries are the bad guys and they take advantage of it at the UN, on the international stage, on a daily basis. 
So, uh, Douglas, um, a lot of the ideas we've been talking about have been very much on the fringe. It was just something happening in some rather strange little universities over in the United States. And then it came over here a bit and people were going, oh, well, it's just a bunch of loony lefties. Who cares? But now it's everywhere. This War on the West, the title of your best-selling new book, is happening 24-7, 365, all over the place. It's happening in our universities, in our businesses, in our government. And a lot of people are very worried about this. I know a lot of parents in our schools as well. Yes. Why does it matter that we confront this and that we, well, take on the war and actually start fighting back? Well, well first, you're completely right, Julie. It is through every single part of British society now. Uh, as I say in the book, and look at anyone who wants a, a public appointment in the UK now must pass the diversity, inclusion and equity testing that the civil service and others force on everyone. Mm -hmm. And that diversity and inclusion and, F, uh, and, and equity testing means you've got to demonstrate that, uh, that you are diverse. Well, diversity in its essence is anti-Western yep. because the West, of course, is a is a multicultural, multi glot place. But once you say it, it, it has no identity of itself other than that, then you are in the realms of what I describe as anti-Westernism. To demonstrate that you have a commitment to diversity says it's not enough, for instance, just to be proud of your country and want to see it do well. You've got to be committed to another ethic other than just Britain yeah. and Britain doing well in the world. This has run through everything, uh, corporations, private companies. It, you know, long ago, as the writer Andrew Sullivan said, we, it was the case that we all live on university now. Yeah. Uh, now, why, why does it matter? Why it matters is because as parents up and down Britain know, their children are indoctrinated into versions of this stuff. Uh, if you look at the polling of what ch of what young people actually know, how few of them have heard of almost any foreign despot, how few of them have heard of Chairman Mao or Stalin, you see that we are presenting a version of history that is incredibly narrow lens in which we are the only bad guys and we don't know anything much about everyone else. Now, here's the thing. The particular evil in this is the evil I'd, I identify in the first chapter, which is the evil of anti-white racism. Yeah. All racism is evil. But the only one that is permissible in our age is anti-white racism. But, it, but the strange children... thing is it's coming from white people. It's white yes. left-wing liberals, so-called, who exactly. are hating not just other white people, but everything the white people have done in the past and in the present, but That's also right. hating presumably themselves as well. Where, where, what is the well, motivation? I'm not sure they do hate themselves. Oh. They love themselves. They're great narcissists themselves. They want everyone else to hate themselves. <laughs> so that white people are told that we are born into a specific type of sin. You know, if we said, I don't know, black people have to be regarded as being born into a particular type of sin because of what their ancestors did uh, and, and said all of their ancestors were slavers, whereas actually only some of their ancestors were slavers. If we said, therefore, in the 21st century, all black people are born into sin, we would not have a problem identifying who that person was. We would say, there's a racist right there. Well, it's the same with the anti-white racists. These are racists who hate white people and believe it is possible to tell white people that from the cradle they are guilty of the sins of their forebears. You, you know, Julia, that, that the ethic of not, um, not levelling the sins of the father on the son is a very important ethic. You know, we don't blame people for what their parents did or their grandparents did, except when it comes to white Westerners, where we are held responsible for things we had nothing to do with. I had nothing to do with slavery or colonialism. Neither did you. Both of these things um, finished years before we were born. And, and, and for most white we people born. in the West, their families like mine would have been, you know, peasant farmers. I mean, or people well, working in the mills. The, the idea that the, the ancestors of white people in the West were having a whale of a time, I don't know, exactly. be at banquets all the time with their, yes. you know, and, and living in gold carriages. It's a nonsense, isn't it? And, that, yes. and that's not I in mean, any way to, to, to make it light of the horrors of slavery. No, but I mean, the past was hell for everybody. You know, yeah. I, I make this. I make this point. I, I say at one point, it, it just does not do down the, the 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 appallingness of the slave trade. But but 
in the 19th century, uh, did people have white privilege if they were white? No, of yeah. course not. Of course yeah. not. The average mill worker in the north of England died in his late 30s, which actually was younger than many um, people working on slave plantations. Uh, it doesn't do away that, with, the, with the evil of slavery, but, but, but the, those people forced to work in mills or mines, they weren't privileged. Mm -hmm. And yet we've entered this incredibly hostile, reductive, American, zero-sum, aggressive, racist game that says all white people are privileged and everyone who was white in history is privileged and all of our ancestors were privileged. Absolutely rubbish. And then you fall into the thing of, and then all white people are guilty. Absolute rubbish. Yeah. No white person is guilty because of how they were born. Indeed. We, like everybody else, should be held to account for things that we have done, not for things that people who may have looked like us in history may have done. Indeed. And just briefly, finally, I mean, the thing that I find about so interesting about this is, is people who have such a negative view of the world and, and of the present as well as of the past because there has mm. never been a better time to be alive. Um, people Absolutely. live More people live longer, happier, healthier lives than ever before and that is largely down to Western civilization. Yes, that's right. I give at the end of the book, you know, a remorseless list of all of the things that the world, the world owes the West. You know, the scientific method, as you mentioned at the beginning, if you want a vaccine, if you want to try to find a cure for degenerative diseases or, 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 or cancers, you don't go to the indigenous peoples of Australia or the First Nations peoples of America. You, you look for the people who are exercising the Western scientific method. And here's the thing. Everybody in the world can use it. It's not there because it's white. It's there because it works. It's the same thing with so much more. And all of this is being attacked as if we have produced nothing when in fact the West has produced more than anyone. And a final point, if I may, why we allow, why we allow this assault on ourselves is one of the great mysteries to, to, to me, which I try to answer and say, we've got to stop. When Sadiq Khan two years ago ordered a Robespierrean style commission into, the, into what in London we are allowed to keep of our history and what we must replace, I say no. Apart from the fact that the people he put in it were all very, very unpleasant as far as I can see, anti-British, anti-Western activists. No, we will not have committees of hostile actors deciding what from our past we're allowed to remember and then shoving up a few banal things from the present to pretend that it's our past. Okay. We don't live in 1984. We're not prisoners of these people. We're not prisoners of our worst critics. We're free people who have the right to feel pride in our past and pride in our present and to do better things in the future. Coming at 7 p.m. on Friday, it's time for Plank of the Week. That's right, it's when we decide who has been the biggest plank this week. Has it been a politician? Has it been a member of the royal family? Or possibly two? Has it been a football team? Has it been an entire country? We will bring you the nominations. I will bring you the actual plank, and the prize is right in front of me here. Don't forget, it's Talk TV, it's me, Mike Graham, and a gorgeous panel of great guests. It's all here. It's 7 p.m. on Friday. Uh, let's talk about oh, the latest madness. Uh, civil servants have been told to call their Christmas parties festive celebrations in an attempt to avoid offending other faiths. Uh, it's an attempt to promote diversity and inclusion. Some officials have been informed they cannot drink out alcohol at celebrations if a team member is teetotal. One civil servant told The Telegraph that the fallout of Partygate also played into the restrictions. Look, no booze, we don't want any, anything coming out about that. But it's not a blanket policy on Christmas parties, but it basically because uh, not everyone will be of Christian faith or will be of other faiths um, uh, entirely, um, that you shouldn't use the word Christmas because that's about Christianity. Is that right? Is that how you have to have a woke Christmas party now? Will someone really be offended? I'm, I'm an atheist. I'm not remotely offended by someone calling a Christmas party. Why? Well, we're having a party. Why are we having a party? Because it's Christmas. That's why we're having the party. That's why we call it a Christmas party, right? Well, let's talk about this with Andrew McDonald. He's a political commentator. Good morning to you, Andrew. Good morning. If you go to a party in December, there's tinsel trees, maybe everyone's having to have a choice of the turkey meal, mince pies at the end. It's a Christmas party. It should be called that, shouldn't it? Well, yes and no. It's it's not specifically related to Christmas. You know, there's no particular hymns. They're not holding a mass of sense. You know, they're not reading from the Bible about, you know, what Jesus did. You know, there's no specific relation to Christmas. It's just a festive 
the festive what, what celebration. Festi for what, what is the festival we are marking? I'm, I look, well, I, well, I don't... Actually, I, originally it was a pagan festival that the Christians kind of jumped yeah. on the bandwagon of, but, you know... Yes, yes, every single religion has some sort of midwinter uh, sort of celebration, basically to get people through the darkest days of winter. Um, I, I was raised by atheist parents as an atheist, raising an atheist child. We mark Christmas, the tree goes up, full Monty, everything. For us, it is a... It's a Christmas tradition. Is a and it's to a certain extent. It's a British tradition. We are we are raised in a Judeo Christian culture, um, where we mark the the religious festivals of Christian religion because that's the origins of our history and our values and our culture and our laws. So we do Easter. We do uh, we do Christmas. For a lot of people in this country, it's not about little baby Jesus being born. It's just about celebrating a. Christmas fest a festival of the country. So why would anyone be offended? No one is no one is having this festival for any other reason, right? Or going for a Christmas party or Christmas meal for any reason other than the fad. It's Christmas. So why would you not use the word Christmas? That's a good point. But you just said about British traditions earlier. The the putting up of the Christmas tree is actually a German tradition, yeah. funnily enough. Um but you know, in the civil service, I had a quick look at the uh, workforce statistics. There are about, of those who declared, there's about 210,000 non-Christians. That's those who don't hold faith or those who are Jewish, Hindu, Muslim, yeah. but only about 150,000 Christians. So if you did it on the on the um, numbers of those who have declared, oh my God. it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense. Party. Just but, have a festive celebration. But I want to say, I've got, I've got numerous, I mean, Jewish friends, for instance, who, who um, and Indian friends and, I mean, Sikh and Hindu religion who all celebrate Christmas. You know why? Because they live here in Britain. And, and there, there, are numerous, there are numerous schools where, you know, but most of the children are, are, are from a Muslim heritage. They still have a Christmas tree up. They sing hymns. It's a British tradition. This country is... I'm still constitutionally, legally, a Christian country, whether people believe in God or not. Um, just because someone isn't of a Christian religion doesn't mean they don't celebrate Christmas. Yeah, it, we, but we do live in a, in a multicultural society. You know, even the recent census data, you know, Christians are now not the majority group. You know, but they're the largest. They're the largest. They are the largest. Christ, that is the largest religious group. That but is even very if you're not, I would not be offended if I was invited to. As some sort of religious festival that was not related to Christianity, I would not be remotely offended by it, or everyone else wants to go off to it. And if, for instance, if I didn't drink for religious or any other reason, I wouldn't think, and this is one of the suggestions of one of these parties, is that, look, because some religions don't drink, I'm thinking, particularly I'm thinking Muslims, um, you can't have alcohol at the party or be in a bar because it's, they'll, they'll find it difficult to come and they're not included. I mean... That's like saying, OK, we can't have turkey and pigs in blankets because there's a vegetarian at the table. That, that, that is a bit extreme, I'll be, I'll be fair to well, you. Well, why do you, you draw know, the line isn't, there? Um, this, it isn't a government-wide um, government policy. This isn't a... No, but it's some stupid policy. diversity it, officer. Individual, no, it's individual managers that have interpreted this from the faith and equality um, work pack that they've got. It's just individual managers being a bit Yeah, silly, but this is the stuff from diversity and inclusion, all those people, they force this stuff on people, and then people get so the knickers in a twist and can't decide what to do. But at the end of the day, you're only having a party and you're only going out for a meal at the end of the year because it's Christmas. That's what we mark in this country. This is a country that has a Christian heritage. I've got no issue with that, even as an atheist. Why should anyone have an issue with it? And if they do have such an issue with it, maybe this isn't the country for them. I, I wouldn't say that, but you know, well, I I did. There, there are there are other major religious events that go on around this yeah, time. And I'm not remotely Hanukkah, bothered. Example. Yeah, yeah. I'm not, my friends who celebrate Hanukkah or Eid or anything, I'm not remote. Have a great time. But, yeah, exactly. So the, why should they have not have a same attitude towards? Okay, Christmas so what? Well? So so if I go, if I went to someone's, um, you know, Eid center, Eid, Eid, you know, I'm mocking Eid. Should I say, well, I drink, so I I I, I want to be included, so everyone else has to have alcohol? No, I mean, exactly. Not the point of Eid. Exactly. I'm just saying it should be just a festive celebration, you know, a nice it's, way to end the. It's the not a year. festive celebration. It's, it's, it's Christmas. It's, 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 if Christmas there's a tree even, and there's tinsel and there's mince pies, it's Christmas. It's Jesus nothing wasn't else. Even born, Jesus wasn't even born this time of year. He was born in. I'm July. not celebrating Christianity. I'm celebrating Christmas. Andrew, we'll have to leave it there, but only because time is against us. Um, Andrew McDonald, political commentator. Um, oh. Mike Graham sitting there. If you can see his face oh, the whole way through that. It's exhausting, isn't it? It's exhausting. I don't even understand. Who are the people getting offended right. by people? It wouldn't bother you to go to someone else's. I, I would go and I'd go, oh, oh is, this, is this what people are doing? No one's forcing anyone to drink alcohol. If you don't want to go, don't go. Yeah.
Uh, well, look, let's turn our attention to other matters. Uh, King Charles III, it's been formally announced after much speculation that King Charles' coronation will be held next spring on Saturday the 6th of May at Westminster Abbey. It was confirmed by Buckingham Palace that Camilla, the Queen Consort, will also be alongside the King and will be uh, crowned in that historic ceremony. However, uh, that uh, coronation is going to be pared down, as we've discussed on the show earlier this week, from the usual four hours down to one and the usual 8,000 guests down to about 2,000 in the uh, the uh, Abbey. Let's talk about this with Rupert Bell, his talk radio's world correspondent. Good morning to you, Rupert. Good morning, Julia. Well, I mean, you don't want to be paid by the hour to cover the uh, the ceremony now, do you? That's that's definitely not the case. Uh, there's no doubt at all this is the right decision to pare it down a bit. We're going to be coming out of probably the worst winter for about 20 years financially for people, having a load of people, you know, with gold crowns and gold coaches and all of the ceremonial stuff. That, frankly, is not going to go down very well with an awful lot of people in this country next May, is it? So King Charles making the right decision there to pare it down a bit? Yes, um, I think it might be a uh, two-hour service, so um, I might get paid for two hours' work, Julia. So, uh, Bargain! Um, just, just the uh, one hour. But, uh, yes, th I think that is the plan. And, obviously, it's a, a date on a Saturday as well. So they've also got the issue of what do they do about there's a bank holiday the previous week. How do they manage that? The whole, um, and, and, clearly, there's been some political discussions as to when the wedding, uh, rather, the uh, coronation <laughs> yeah. wedding, the coronation should take place. Uh, and that is obviously um, uh, uh, got to be worked out properly. So will they move that May Day bank holiday uh, forward uh, to the Friday to make it a long weekend? There will be all sorts of discussions well, that, I'm sure taking understand. place in the, in the meantime. My, my colleague here in the studio, Sam Armstrong, has pointed out, why can't these decisions be made in advance? I mean, I can't, obviously you can't make these decisions in advance before the Queen's uh, uh, sad death, but um, why, why is there the debate in, in, you know, in, in the country first before these things happen? I'd like to say, as someone whose birthday is on May the 2nd, it always, I've got a four in seven chance <laughs> of getting a bank holiday, a lot, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, a long weekend uh, for my birthday. Um, I'm, I do not want that bank holiday they moved don't see why it should be moved there'll be a lot of people though who've made holiday plans often this can be around your time when people you know you can take a week off but then you take four days holiday this is going to affect people and 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 also again we're coming in we've got our economy we've just got the latest figures we, we, we you know we, we're 0.3 percent fall in gdp bank holidays can actually cost the economy i know a lot of people might go and spend money as well but they can do that the weekend before what, what why is it even necessary well, I, I suppose it's the way they say, just um, in a way like the Platinum Jubilee, so that people can celebrate what it... Uh, the, what well, the they Platinum can do that Jubilee. on the Saturday. Well, that's why they're probably going to... Uh, why they're holding the coronation on the Saturday. It's whether they make it a whole uh, weekend. It's by no means cast in stone what they're going to do. Uh, but they have established May the 6th. Mm -hmm. That is the main focus of attention. Yeah. It's what goes on around it. And that is where the pairing dial element comes into it so will be and it will still have all the pomp and ceremony to be anointing of the oil or of the of the monarch and and all that and all the jewels will be moved from the tower of london so they'll be on display and used throughout the ceremony so it will still feel like a coronation but it mm. won't look like the 1953 version which well, was uh, very definitely over the top scaffolding all over westminster abbey with eight thousand people crammed into it back to 2000 so it actually tries to fit into what obviously will be a long winter. And as we emerge out of that, mm. the, and certainly the, the political situation, may the move will may be, uh, certainly the na natives in this country might be restless by then. Indeed. So, well, look, it, it'll still look pretty sumptuous, let's be honest. And anyway, if you're going to have a monarchy, what's the point of doing it unless you are going to have all that pageantry? And we were talking, you, know, you and I spoke many times about the yeah. spellbinding pageantry we saw with the Queen's funeral and that, you know, broadcast around the world. And, you know, I mean, and a lot of the arguments people give for monarchy is this is a you know, message around the world the soft power and the tourism appeal well as you know certainly has that can i also ask you about the younger royals once again our good friend Meghan markle back in the news she's got a new one of her i still don't know how to pronounce it, archetypes the yeah. kids it's named off the kid archie archetypes podcast that she's done with apparently some celebrity actresses who i've never heard of i mean i've got no idea who these people are but anyway it's all about Meghan anyway I'm sorry to do this to people. If you want to just go nip to the loo or put the kettle on or just do something very loud so you don't have to hear this for 30 seconds, I completely understand. I, but do come back in 30 seconds' time. Let's have a little listen to Meghan Markle discussing how terrible her life is once again on her podcast. Raise your hand if you've ever been called 
crazy or hysterical (laughs) or what about nuts, insane, out of your mind, completely irrational. Okay, you get the point. Now, if we were all in this same room and could see each other, I think it would be pretty easy to see just how many of us have our hands up. By the way, me too. And it's no wonder when you consider just how prevalent these labels are in our culture. It just, um, I, I just, it's just even hearing her voice, Rupert. I, what can I say? She's whinging and moaning again. And basically she's talking about how she, you know, the, the, there are these stereotypes and I do accept that. Um, but she's sort of talking about how she's being called these things and isn't it terrible? I mean, hasn't she been called some of these things because of actually what she said and what she's done rather than just because she's a woman? Uh, another eye-rolling moment from me there, Julia, I have to say. It, it's like, it's this Californian culture of everything has to be analysed. You've got to go and oh. see a therapist. That is, um, and why can't people take a, it sometimes take a look at themselves when they haven't really got a problem? And I'm not sure Megan has got huge problems because <laughs> she's living in a million dollar house and she's extremely comfortable but it's the woe is me feeling that she always wants to create and I, you know does she she doesn't sound happy no but also That's she's got this idea about these stereotypes about women and then you think sorry says the woman who yeah. was a two-bit actress who married a mm. prince um and then gave up her job and then i mean come on lady uh, i mean give me give me a break here. she's also complaining at some point in, about the, the tv series how i met your mother which i think was brilliantly fun mm. one of the uh characters uh talks about this 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 crazy hot matrix so basically if a woman is this crazy then she has to be this hot that matrix that's a well-known you know online meme it's really funny and my husband can attest really really accurate as well um and when he showed it to me the first time my first question was oh where am i on it i was quite proud actually apparently (laughs) where i'd moved from one when he first met me a place on the matrix to another place i mean take a joke lady well and this is it it's it says everything has to be taken seriously there's no time for joy and laughter it would seem because you in her life it seems you have to be analyzing every second of the day yeah. and make sure you are aware of your feelings 100% Can of the time Can I just say Rupert I've just thought of a great sitcom and it's mm-hmm. you at home with Meghan Markle I would oh. so watch that uh, it, it, it might be short and taken <laughs> off the air fairly quickly because I'm. <laughs> 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 uh, Who buy? That's the question. Well, uh, yeah, Rupert, yeah. always good to talk to you. Talk, uh, talk radio is a royal correspondent. Join me, Ian Collins, every day on Talk TV. There is nothing we hate more than hypocrisy. Discussing the big issues. Why was it so hard to establish the deputy leader was at a meeting with her colleagues? The callers. Alan in Grimsby. Tracy in Burton on Trent. Dave, thank you very much. Picking apart the big stuff. This simply does not wash. Look who's back under the spotlight. We know if you work for the BBC, you have to sign a contract, whether you're a freelancer or whether you're, uh, whether you're on staff, basically saying that you will not display your political views in public, on social media or elsewhere. Uh, you have to be studiously neutral, particularly if you're involved in news gathering or political reporting. Some people, though, seem to get a larger, well, a much longer reign than others when it comes to their views. But in particular, let's face it, Gary Lineker, of course, presents Match of the Day, who tweets pretty much incessantly, really very openly blatant bias views against largely Tory government, Brexit, you name it, the usual stuff. Well, yesterday his tweets uh, came under the spotlight uh, when the Director General of the BBC, uh, Tim Davey, appeared before the Digital Culture, Media and Sports Select Committee of MPs after they returned uh, from their summer holiday break. And he described Gary Lindica's approach to impartiality as, in his words, a work in progress but he did give the match today presenter his full backing well let's talk about this with john mayer he's a former bbc producer and joins us right now he's also by the way uh, author of boris johnson media creation comic casualty good morning to you hello julia great to talk to you i think we can i think we can guess from your book title you're, you're probably where your your political views at might lie we certainly no, have no, a, no, no. I'm, we, I'm, I'm a purely objective journalist purely objective you know, journalist okay I, 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 I treat Boris as a comic because that's what he is. Um, no, <laughs> nice. no one, Gary Lineker. Um, can talk radio and talk sport actually give the BBC any lessons in in, in opinion? I mean, this is this is what you are. Talk talk. Yes, sport. that's our job. 
That's, that's, know, that's I'm literally that's, employed to give my opinion. That is my job. If you present on the BBC, your job is quite specifically including not giving your opinion on, on controversial okay. issues. Gary gives his opinion on sport every Saturday night and, and, and on. I mean, I, you know, I think he's an intelligent footballer. What's wrong with that? The talk sport doesn't have a lot of intelligent footballers okay. on it. Excuse, um, excuse, excuse, John, can we have a conversation without you uh, busy being rude about my fantastically brilliant colleagues, by the way, uh, at, at TalkSport, our sister sure, station? Um, I'm not being rude about anyone at the BBC and their intelligence. I think this, can I say, this is one of the issues. Why is it any debate about opinion? People have to be question people's intelligence. It's really quite bizarre. Um, the key thing is, Gary Lineker is employed to give his opinion on sport. Now, he's not a yes. he's not the political editor. He's not the presenter of the Today programme. I get that, of course not. So there's going to be a little bit more leeway. Um, and you wouldn't expect any of those people to give their political preferences. One things like Laura Kunzberg got a horrible amount of grief. I've never known what Laura Kunzberg's views are on, on uh, political parties, and that's the right way about it. However, it's very clear what Gary Gary Lineker's general political views are. I might not necessarily know how he might vote in a general election, but he often talks about and tweets about very controversial issues. Now, free speech, he's got a right to talk about anything he wants. But when you work for the BBC, whether you're freelance or not, whether you work in the political or news gathering department, you are required to maintain impartiality, are you not? Well, he's a freelance, you know. He's, he's, he's so not what? You still sign a contract? He's, he, you know, he, he's a great presenter. I mean, I think he sometimes goes over the top. They always do. But once you get a platform, we have opinion. But, you know, he, he's a brilliant presenter, worth every penny of whatever it is, 1.6 million. I think he's a fantastic football presenter. But he doesn't just talk about football, does he? He tweets about other issues. So let's not let's not talk about the football side of things. I, I think a lot of people think he's paid too much. I, he, he's, he's a former captain of the England team. If that's what he's worth is on the market, that's what his worth is. But when we when it comes to him basically tweeting about Brexit, tweeting about Tory policies, tweeting about a lot of issues which are clearly critical of the government, yeah. is that appropriate for someone employed on whatever contract at the BBC? Would you extend that to comedians then? Would you extend that to, to people in drama? Is everybody muted because they work for the BBC? Do, do, they, do they all have to, 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 to not have an opinion? Um, but drama is very different. If someone writes a drama, I would expect there to be, frankly, be nice to see a drama that wasn't entirely, you know, from a leftist standpoint at some point on the BBC when it comes to any any political issue. Uh, and certainly comedians, I mean, we see them criticising and quite, uh, uh, hey, mocking mocking politicians is 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 not only vital in a democracy, it's, it, is, it is key part of our democracy. I mean, it absolutely underpins our democracy. But we don't see, I mean, we, do, we see extraordinary amount of bias on that. Have I got news for you the other day? Um, I mean, it's just basically abusive terms about uh, the outgoing what, Prime Minister. What, what, it's not really Julia, comedy, what, is it? Julia, what did you expect? Come on. But, I, know, I didn't expect Boris, anything better, no. No, no, but, but Boris is a comic figure. Boris is a comic figure who made a lot of his reputations for Have I Got News For You. Of course they're going to take the rise out of Boris. Mm. You know? Oh, yes. But, but Boris is, and, and so should, should the Director General go in and say to them, look, guys, go, go light on Boris, you know? No, it's not a question. No, 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 I don't think anyone's asking anyone to go light on. And certainly we had a, um, a, a there was another programme uh, which was also criticised. Oh, we had um, Joe Lysett, Joe Lysett, Lysett, on, Lysett on, 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 uh, on the new Sunday which, morning which show. Is, which is pure irony, you know. Mm. That was pure irony. I mean, who knows whether he's very right wing or not? No, we do you know. We do know his politics. Of course we know his politics. But, no, yeah, 100% I know his politics. But is, his, is, he, is he right wing? No, of course he isn't. That was the joke. Uh, that was okay. the joke. No, but this is the oh. thing, John, this is the thing. When it only goes one way, then that's an issue. Because I was told, when I, I used to work at a, a, another radio station, and I, I'd been uh, approached by the BBC on a number of occasions, and I was told very clearly, look, if you did ever work at the BBC, you'd never be able to give a political view on social media at all. But the rules seem to be different. If your political views, and we see we saw that with people like Emily Maitlis before she left, if your political views align to what the average, the, the, the typical worker at the BBC thinks, and, you know, sort of Guardian reading North London metropolitan elite, then they don't think it's biased, they think it's neutral, even though those views are blatantly politically biased. I think there's a conspiracy theory in there somewhere. No, there you isn't. Know. You're, you're, you're saying that the BBC is full of liberal lefty wokists. I'm not it's saying not. it. I know it. Well, I I, I work there. And I, I met some some rank Tories in the BBC. I can tell you. And then 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 there are even more now than there ever were. So you know, let, let's get rid of the the myth that the BBC. It's not a, it's not a myth. 
I, I, listen, I can tell you, I can tell you, as someone perceived to be right wing who's a Brexiteer, you walk through the BBC, you know exactly what people's politics are. From well, well, what's, what's the paper most read in the BBC newsrooms? Yeah, well, Not the Guardian, the, the Daily Mail. Where, where, where do they take their agenda from? The Daily Mail, not The Guardian. They, I, <laughs> I don't think you're reading the BBC website that closely. I think you think quite quite the opposite on that front. Uh, so as far as you're concerned, Gary Lineker can tweet about anything he wants, I, and it's not an issue. I think t t Tim is right to call it a work in progress, you know, <laughs> um, which, uh, which is uh, uh, an interesting phrase he used. I mean, the trouble is Gary, Gary Lineker be, being a, a superstar can actually dictate his own terms, sadly. That, that, that's the crucial thing, isn't it? Different rules for different people. And he's had a recent battle with uh, one of the guys uh, working in the newsroom about his, his impartiality there. John Mayer, former BBC producer. Just tell us um, I exactly what it is that uh, Nicola Sturgeon had to say, because it was an interview with The Times in the run-up to Thursday's local elections happening across the country. Um, the SNP is planning to allow... Uh, Scottish people to change their legal sex simply by making a declaration. Um, just, just simply, just I identify as the opposite sex. End of the matter. That's your legal status. Full stop. Um, she was asked to define well, what is a woman, but she refused to do so. Yes, um, and I think probably the reason for that is because Nicola Sturgeon does have a definition of women, but it's probably not one that you or I would actually agree with. And we know this because earlier this year, we took the Scottish government to court and we won at appeal on the definition of woman in a piece of Scottish legislation, the Gender Representation on Public Boards Act. And what they had tried to do was to define woman as anybody who says they're a woman. Yeah. So, and the examples that they used were changing your name on your driver's license, using pronouns, she, her pronouns, and it was very vague. They said you didn't have to have gone through any process. You didn't have to dress or present in a certain way. You just had to self-declare. And yeah. nobody even had to check. So during that process as well, what came out was the Scottish government had a policy that nobody had heard of before, which said that they considered trans women to be women unless they were legally prohibited from treating them as such in law. So what's quite clear is that Nicola Sturgeon doesn't actually believe that women define a sex category. Yeah. And probably the reason she don't want to say it is because she knows that most people think that's an absurdity. And, but this is the thing, it has become the norm and we've had, you know, Keir Starmer, you know, not being able to define things. We've had, uh, you know, Liberal Democrats, we've had a number of Tories and we really had to push for Boris Johnson. Rishi Sunak sort of failed to give me a definitive answer. I just said, I disagree with what the Prime Minister said yesterday when he was on my show a little while ago. It's amazing how far it is for people to, you know, it's a very simple definition. It's an adult, human, female. That's what it is. That is what a woman is. Now, we had that whole Stonewall campaign, trans women are women. And, and we've got a situation on social media. I mean, it depends, you know, now Elon Musk is in charge of Twitter, maybe it's allowed. You, you know, to even say trans women are not women is regarded as transphobic, as hateful, as, as uh, divisive, as opposed to a simple statement of fact. The, the use of the word trans is short for transition, which means you have transitioned from being a man to a woman, which means you're not a woman because you're not an adult human female because you were born male. Now, there's no hate involved in that. There's no transphobia involved in that. Um, you're not staying with division. You're simply making statements. And, and this is where we get into this battle about sex and gender. And I think for most people, Frankly, they're either having a nice late morning eating the breakfast, they was already at work, travelling to work, getting the kids after school in the morning. Doing a, we do not spend most of our time wondering, oh, is that your gender or your sex? It's really obvious. No one's ever needed to tell me what their personal pronouns are because I can see very clearly what they are. It's not a big issue for the vast majority of us. Um, and, and yet this is something that our politicians have embroiled themselves in. And, and now they're coming up against the cold, hard reality of voters' actual sense and common sense. And voters don't like this madness. No, they don't. And, you know, it, it, what Sturgeon is, has been doing is she's refused to engage. She's, she's said that our concerns aren't valid. She said that she's allowed ministers in her government, especially the Green ministers, to make all sorts of unpleasant insinuations about women like me and women like J.K. Rowling who are opposed to this. Mm -hmm. And she she hasn't spoken out when members of her own party have been targeted by online mobs or indeed had 
credible threats made against them. So she's ignored all that. And now she's saying she's a feminist and that she fights sexism. But we've yet to see the evidence of that. Mm. And if she really was interested in fighting sexism, she'd actually want to listen to some of these things. Because we, we, we were saying this morning, we're seeing with um, what is happening in the US with the potential overturning of Gray versus Wade. This is the abortion rights, yes. Yeah. And um, women on the left who have been completely completely taken over by trans ideology there are talking about rights for birthing bodies, which is an absurd and horrific and dehumanizing way to talk about women. Yeah. And it actually doesn't help no. because if we think of women as just receptacles for babies, then it's actually easier to take those rights away. Yeah, and, and this so, is the thing, it's the people who complain the most about, oh, it's terrible sexism, we need women-only shortlists, we need, you know, more women in Parliament, we've had this big Westminster sleaze row, and then you say, oh, look, you want to find a woman. Well, a woman is anyone who says they're a woman. Oh, well, in that case, we can just have loads more men in Parliament yes. who say they're women. I mean, all these people like Donald Trump, you know, horrible, I mean, I'm sorry, horrible sexist pig. If, I wish, I wish, before he left office, Donald Trump, instead of inciting riots, had actually said, I identify as a woman. And then he would have been, according to the Democrats, many of them, he would have been the first female president. Because if you say you're a woman, you are a woman. You know that's nonsense. I know that's nonsense. I think secretly deep down, people like Nicola Sturgeon and, and Keir Starmer and others who, who spout this nonsense claptrap, I think they know it's nonsense. I think they have exactly the same common sense, biologically fact-based views as everyone else in their private lives. And, 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 and yet, why do, who, do, who do they think they're appealing to when they make these public statements? That's the bit I don't get, because I don't think that a few thousand people on Twitter get to decide elections. No, it's a very interesting one. I, I do worry about Sturgeon. I think probably you're right that Keir Starmer is well aware. I think Nicola Sturgeon has been very captured by this and she is very determined and i think she possibly sees this as her legacy and she's determined to drive on with it i don't think anything else would explain why she is so resistant to the idea of having a conversation you know just a, a decent conversation about why there are violent men in scottish women's prisons yeah. at the moment why why this horrific school guidance came in that said that um girls couldn't object to teenage boys in the showers and mm. that, that children could be transitioned behind parents' back. And yeah. why she is refusing to address what's happening in the Sanderford Clinic, which is our gender clinic that deals with young people. And as opposed to what is happening with the CAS review now in, in England, she said she'll look at it, but she's also passed the buck this week in Parliament and yeah. said this is a matter of... But this, is it. This, is, this was a very much a, a very fringe conversation and people use these terms like turf. And you talk to most people, what's a turf? A trans-exclusionary radical feminist, gender-critical theory, all, that. all this stuff, it's pie-in-the-sky nonsense, doesn't mean anything. But when you say to people, do you think that a man on a Thursday afternoon can say he's a woman and that makes him a woman, people look at you and look off they splutter into their pints and their cups of tea and say you're insane and that's because and that's not that these are not people who in any way be abusive or or disrespectful or unkind to someone who is genuinely living a, 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 as a trans person um and, and i don't know anyone who feels that who, who is among the people who are questioning this um but we have this across the board it's not just this it's not just this sort of esoteric sort of theoretical philosophical argument it's happening in reality you talked about you know male male prisoners being put into female prisons we've had women who've been who've been raped and sexually assaulted behind bars where they are incredibly vulnerable most women bearing in mind behind bars not for any violent assaults or anything vast majority of the men who identify as women behind bars in our, our prison system are men who've been convicted of sexual assault and rape for goodness sake what does that tell you now that's not to say that trans people are abusers it's to say that sexual abusers will use these laws aimed at protecting trans people and to use them to gain access to to uh, to uh, you know to their prey can i ask you also about something that's happening uh, david cameron back with the big society that's a long time ago isn't it he set up 
the National Citizen Service um, and includes some um, summer camps for 16 and 17 year olds mm-hmm. and you go away for a week or two. Um, well, it turns out they've had a policy which parents weren't informed about that any boy at 16 or 17, and we know how in no way do hormones rule the 16 to 17 year old boys of this world, that uh, boys are being allowed to self-identify as girls and to be allowed to sleep in the girls' dormitory uh, and to, to use the girls' showers and loos and, and changing rooms. Now, I'm sorry, I'm the mother of a 15 year old girl. I don't bloody well think so. No, and I, I think these these um, these organisations are potentially opening themselves up to really serious court cases at some point because if a girl is assaulted and they've put a biological boy in there, yep. they are going to they are going to be in trouble. And um, it's one of the things that's really really troubling about the Scottish proposals is that this idea that they're going to let children at the age of 16 change their legal sex because when we're talking about schools at the moment schools and this youth organization should be able to say no legal males legal females end off um but what the scottish government is proposing is that that change is made at 16 and head teachers have said it's going to be harder to include those exclude those boys from girls space if they've legally changed their sex there's a lot in this i mean when when you were talking about trans people i think what we have to realise is the Scottish government's proposals don't even mention trans people. They're not about trans people. Yeah. They're about anybody. Yeah. For any reason. It's... And if they think that predators will not take advantage of something that is open to anybody for any reason. They're crazy. I mean, they are crazy. That's the key thing.